who will um, demonstrate for you being an older person based on whatever ticket you pick from the basket. There's four possibilities. You can have lung and thorax, cardioperipheral, muscle skeletal, or, cardi or, or neuro. Okay? So there are four scenarios. So once you pick from the basket, then um, you'll also get the scenario that accompanies that particular uh, system. So there'll be like a little blurb, so you know something about the person. Do they have Parkinson's disease? Um, are they complaining that maybe in the past they've had high blood pressure? So you'll have a little scenario to base it on, okay, with the person's name. Then you'll have uh, an opportunity to pick up two copies of the um, sub, uh, subjective form, two copies, two copies of the um, general survey form, two copies of the modified health history form, and two copies of the PE, the physical exam form for that system. One you'll start using just as a, a, a little sheet so that you, as you go along you're documenting it. After you've finished your exam, you'll have plenty of time. There's no time limit for writing it up because the examiner can't read hieroglyphics. So you'll have time to rewrite everything so it's legible and then you'll staple it together. There's no ROI model. We're not doing nursing diagnosis, anything like that. So if you look at the OSSI form, the first portion there is professionalism. You know, what does that mean? It's breaking it down into points. Um, you're going to come in uniform with your name tag, and your uniform shouldn't look like it just came out of the dryer, if you got my drift. Okay? It should be neat. Hair pulled back so it doesn't fall into your face. Um, no jewelry except for a watch, a wedding band if you have one, no rings, no bracelets, no necklaces, unless it's a religious medal. Okay? And that's just not for this course, it's for every course especially when you go to clinical. Nails, no nail polish. They should be cut short because you're going to be touching patients and palpating or percussing. Okay? Um, earrings, one small earring in each ear, no bigger than the dime. Okay? That's important. Um, you're going to use lay terminology when you're talking to your patient but the examiner needs to know what you're thinking and what you're seeing. So you'll use nursing nomenclature when you're uh, doing your assessment. So that, for example, when you're listening um, to the uh, heart sounds, cardiac sounds, you're not just going to move your stethoscope around the pericardium. You're going to say, and I'll demonstrate for you, this is the aortic area. This is where I can hear the loudest the S2 sound. It's the dub of love dub. It's when the ventricles are contracting. That's, as an examiner, what I expect you to say. Okay? Doesn't help the patient, but the examiner needs to know what you're listening to. Okay. All right. Um, so let's. Any questions about that? The process. Okay. Let's look at doing your modified health history. Now, when you meet your client or patient, and I use those terms interchangeably, I would say, you know, as they come into the room where they're sitting in the exam table, hello, I'm Susie Smart. I'm a, a nursing student at Stockton University. And today I'm going to ask you some questions, okay, let's just make this up now, about your breathing and your lungs. Okay, and then I'm going to actually listen to your lungs. Okay, do you have any questions? Okay, as we go along, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so you're making eye contact. You're going to be getting some information about your client that you're going to use on your general survey as well. But um, make sure you shake their hand. You introduce yourself, who you are, from Stockton University. You're not from. Uh, Rutgers, you're not from Atlantic Care Community College. They need to know where you're from. This becomes very important when you start clinical, okay, because you're going to be in agencies with students from other places, so get used to it. Tell them what your role is. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about your heart. 
and then I'm going to actually take your blood pressure, listen to your heart. Whatever the system is, you've got to let them know. At the end, you'll see, I'll demonstrate, you do a summary. So they have a, some idea of what you found, okay? Now, as I said, there are going to be four scenarios that the standardized patients will practice and they'll be able to, um, you know, limp a little bit or act like an older person. You're not to pretend when you're assessing your patient that they have the same symptoms. When you do your write-up and you do your actual PE, you only document what you see, you hear, or you feel. You don't try to make it correspond with what that scenario says, okay? For example, if it has to do with Parkinsonism, say the patient is pretending they have a tremor, well, unless you actually see them with a tremor, you're not going to document that, okay? Because, you know, they're not going to be having any of those conditions, okay? Does that make sense? Do we understand that? Okay. So, the first thing you're going to do is your subjective piece. Everyone is going to do the modified health history. It looks like this. Does that look familiar? So you'll get two copies, one that you'll quickly write things down on. So let's go through. You're going to say, have you had any operations? And if they say yes, what did you have and when did you have it? As far as medical, do you have any history of heart problems? Um, any history of diabetes? And they said, no, I've been perfectly okay, but when I was five years old, I had my tonsils out, uh, and that was 1981, okay, or whatever. Family history, you're just going to go back one generation. So you tell me what's something that runs in people's families that you would ask. Diabetes. Diabetes is one. Well, that's heart, but yes, cardiac problems, because... Uh, People might have, yeah. Another one? Um, mental health. Yeah, depression. I wouldn't say mental health because right. they're not going to know what the heck you're talking about. Can you give me another one? Mm -hmm. High cholesterol? Um, it can, but it's not one of the big ones. Um, sleep apnea? No. Okay. Cancer, right? That's a big one. And then you want to know what kind of cancer. Glaucoma runs in families, okay? Kidney disease, you don't have to go through all of them, but the main ones. And if they say yes, you want to know is it on the maternal side or the paternal side, because that makes a difference. And you're only going to go one generation. Okay, medications. We want to know, do they know what they're taking? Okay, I take um, something for high blood pressure, but I'm not sure of the name. Okay, that's all you could document then. But if you know, they say, I take lisinopril for high blood pressure. I would also want to know, do they know the dose? So I want to know what they take, do they know why they take it, and how much they take. Also, over the counter, people don't think, you know, that's important, but sometimes, for example, St. John Wort that people might take for depression can also interfere if they're going to have anesthesia for surgery. So you need to know, are they taking any vitamins, any probiotics, anything for dry eye over the counter? You want to know that. Okay. Allergies. Now, I've had clients say, you know, I'm allergic to erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. And so I ask, what happens when you take that? Because sometimes they say they're allergic because they can't swallow it, the pill's too big, versus having an allergy response to it. So if someone tells you they have allergic re response to a medication, you want to know what is their response. Why don't you grab a chair and put your coat up there, please? Because we're going to be using those uh, exam tapes. We also want to know if they're allergic to anything in their environment. Latex is a big problem these days. Um, I had a nursing student once who was allergic 
to evergreens, you know, at Christmas time with the trees. So, you know, pet dander, do they have any allergies? If they don't, you can say, write down NKA, no known allergies, NKA. Smoking. Well, people say, oh no, I, I used to smoke years ago, I don't smoke now. <laughs> Well, what, when did you smoke and for how long and how many cigarettes per day or per week? That's what you need to know. Alcohol. What would you say if your client or patient says, well, I, I'm a social drinker? What would you say to that? How much do you drink? Uh -huh. Yeah, because what you think is a social drinker and what I think is a social drinker could be miles apart. So you want to know when they drink, maybe it's on the weekend, but what do they drink? Wine, beer, hard liquor, what? Then, do they use any recreational drugs? So we go on with the modified <laughs> health history and everyone's going to do it. Every one of you will have to do this with your client. What is their current living environment? Do they live in an apartment, senior housing, house, trailer, and do they feel safe there? Okay? Occupation. Uh, the uh, standardized patients are gonna be acting as older adults. So they might say, oh, well, I'm retired. Well, fine, but you need to know what they worked at before because some of them may have worked in a factory exposed to loud noise or to chemicals, you need to know that, right? And then lastly, you want to know the highest level of education they've completed. <coughs> Any questions about doing your modified health history? Become familiar with it. Remember I said five minutes for the subjective. No more than that or you're encroaching on your time limit. And believe me, students who go over, we cut them off because there's another student waiting to be tested. You'll have plenty of time to do the write-up later, but you only get that 30 minutes. So you want to be familiar. You want to be organized. You don't want to be thinking, geez, what do I have to ask next, you know? All right. Objective queuing for the system you select. This is where you're going to have to do a PQRSTU on one problem. Okay? If you don't do it, you're going to get points taken off. So let's review <coughs> what I'm talking about. If your patient says a positive response to a question, for example, on the um, respiratory system, the thorax uh, system. Uh, maybe you're asking them if they've had any problems with coughing, okay? Now we want to get more information about that positive symptom, right? And if you don't have room on your front sheet of your queuing sheet, write an arrow and the examiner will know to look in the back because you're going to have to have P, you write out P, and then you talk about the provocative or palliative problem. It's really the P is the problem that they're addressing, such as cough. Or headache is another common one. I think uh, the neurosystem, I think uh, one of the scenarios the person has gets headaches. The Q stands for quality or quantity. So if I'm talking about the cough, I want to know how often, do they bring up any mucus, and then what color it is. If it's a headache, I want to know, um, you know, does it interfere with their activities of daily living? We'll talk about severity in a minute, but how often are they getting those headaches? Um, R stands for region or radiation. So if the person has a headache, I want to know, can they show me where they typically have the headache? Bilateral, unilateral, feels like a hat band. This helps to distinguish later on between migraines and stress headaches, for example. <coughs> then I want to know, does it um, 
radiate anywhere. Some people who have headaches then also have neck pain, okay? Um, severity scale. We use the zero to 10 scale, and this can be used not just for pain, but for dizziness, for stiffness, for nausea, for anything that you're measuring. But you need to include that you've used the scale zero to 10, and whatever the symptom is, the client says right now, because that's what you want to know right now, it's a six or a five. But you need to say, I've used a scale zero to 10 or zero to five, so the person reading it has some idea what you're using. Uh, the timing, the T stands for timing. When does a headache usually occur? Or when did it first begin? Two months ago when I was getting, uh, just started here at, at Stockton or Manahawkin or wherever, um, I felt a lot of stress. And I think that's what triggered my headaches. And that has to do with understanding the last you. But timing could be, um, I get the headaches, it wakes me up in the morning, or um, I get them um, after I've been on my computer uh, or texting all day. So that's what the uh, timing is. So you'll do at least one, and, and you should only have to do one PQRSTU, okay? You're not gonna sit there and do 10 of them. Any questions about that? That's a subjective um, view. Yeah. Actually, yeah, for cough, um, what is the scale? Like, what would you be reading? The on? same thing. Just, I know, but like. like uh, the, um, the hacking of the cough, okay. the irritation of the cough. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Because okay. sometimes people think, I only can use a severity scale for pain. That's what yeah. we associate it with. But if it's something like stiffness in my joints, you still need to have a scale. So you can use the same one, but put from zero to 10, or zero to five, and right now the client says four, or two, or one. Okay. Did you have a question right here? Okay. All right, so now we're gonna look at one of the four systems. And I'm going to be able to demonstrate on you. And I'm gonna ask you, first one I'm gonna do is the lung and respiratory system. I'm going to use the table here. Sounds and heart sounds. Okay. On your, uh, and I'm going to skip around. Did you did you bring your um, PE form for thorax? Yes. Okay. You might want to look at it because I'm going to skip around. I'll cover everything, <coughs> but I have to have be organized. Now I know from looking at that form that I have to get the person's respiratory rate. And. I can do this one of two ways. I can listen in the back, but I find it easier to pretend I'm taking their pulse, find the pulse, bring it across the chest, and I'm going to count the breaths. Inspiration, expiration is one. And I'm going to count for 30 seconds, multiply it by two. But I also want to get not only the rate, but I want to get the pattern. I want to, because we all sigh when we're breathing, right? But I want to see, is the pattern normal, regular? And I'll put an R for regular, or an I if the pattern to me is irregular, okay? So you can do it this way, which I think is easier to get the respiratory rate, <laughs> or we can listen back here <coughs> with the stethoscope. Okay, after I've done that, and I mark it down as I go, because I'll never remember if I have to wait to the end. I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna lift this up. Maybe you can help hold it up for me. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm gonna ask my client to just flex his neck a little bit. What am I looking for? I'm looking first at the spinal column. I wanna make sure it's midline. I'm looking for scoliosis, which is an S shape. Okay. You might want to come to this side so you can be see. looking over the skin. If I notice any mole, I'm going to palpate it, but I'm also going to ask my client, do you realize that you have a mole right where I'm pressing? Why is that important? Because most of us can't see our back, and we don't know if we have a dermatology problem. So if I tell my client, yep, yeah, you got a mole right here, and he says, yes, I know that, but there hasn't been any changes in it, I'm gonna do a little drawing on my 
PE form indicating where it is so that the physician who's going to look at or nurse practitioner will know that I'm aware there's a mole here, it's brown, what size it is, I palpated, it's not, there's no nodule there, little hair coming from it, okay? And otherwise, the skin is consistent throughout. The next thing I want to do <coughs> is compare the transverse diameter of the thorax to the anterior posterior thorax. Why is that important? Someone tell me. I don't know your name, so you're free to, I can just point to you. Because um, you want to make sure that the transverse diameter is greater than the anterior posterior. Right. And how can I do that? The only way I can do it is coming from the side, I can have my client raise their arms up so I can actually see. You can't look from the back, from the front. You have to come from the side to see that the transverse diameter is twice the size as the AP diameter. And I'm going to show you the documentation when I'm all finished with the system, okay? When would the AP diameter be greater? That's right. You know why? But what causes the barrel chesting? There you go. The, the alveoli are little balloons, and someone has emphysema or COPD, they can get the oxygen in, they have trouble getting the waste products out, and it balloons out. You have a lot of alveoli ballooned out, it's going to cause the barrel chesting. Okay? All right. Next, I'm going to auscultate. Why do I auscultate next? Because there are some breast sounds that we call adventitious. Okay? And one of the adventitious breath sounds are called crackles or rails, depending on the source. Crackles and rails are the same thing. These are discontinuous adventitious sounds. What does that mean, Dr. Ginelli? It means that if you have the patient take deep breaths, cough, change position, you're not going to hear it. Or you're going to hear it, and then you're going to call someone else over to verify, and they're going to say, I didn't hear anything. Okay, so that's why we're going to auscultate before we do any deep breathing. Now, unlike Jarvis, we're not going to look at listen in 20 spots because we don't want our patient to hyperventilate and get dizzy. Okay, but we are going to ask our patient to breathe a little harder than you normally would. I want you to breathe in through your nose when I tell you, out through your mouth. And before I begin, I'm going to show you the six areas that you're going to listen to. Between the scapula, a little bit below the scapula, you're going to have your client raise their arm, put their hand behind their head so you can listen under each axillary area. Six spots. Okay, you can just relax. If you want to. All right, I'm going to listen in six areas. I have to have firm contact if a person is very hairy, a male, then you want to wet the hair down on the back so it doesn't scratch on your diaphragm, and you say, oh boy, that person has uh, gurgles, okay? Because that's the other adventitious <laughs> sound, or gurgles, also known as ronchi. And then the third type is wheezing. Some normal people have wheezing. You hear it more on expiration than inspiration or a pleural friction rub, which you might hear in someone who has very severe pneumonia or bronchitis. So what kind of sound should I normally hear on Taylor? Resonance. No, not resonance. You're thinking of percussion, right? What sound? I'm not hearing it from anybody here. I have good hearing. Vesicular sounds. Vesicular sounds is when inspiration is normally greater than expiration. And it sounds like leaves on a tree. If you hear bronchial sounds or bronchovesicular, that's not normal. The only place you should hear that is up in the upper airways, above the, where the trachea is, where the main uh, left and right bronchi are. Those are normal sounds there. But where we're listening to, the only sound you should normally hear is the vesicular. Are we clear on that? Yes. Okay. <coughs> I 
I also make sure my diaphragm is warm so I don't have you jumping up. All right, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. Again. 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 Now, would you raise your arm up here? Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. Okay, one more time here. Okay, just relax. So I heard vesicular sounds throughout. But if I don't, if I hear wheezing, I want to indicate where I hear the wheezing from. Next, since I have my stethoscope out, I'm going to do what is called egophony. What is egophony? And I apologize, I don't know your name. Um, it's when you uh, ask a patient to say an E sound that you should not hear an A. Right. And it's a clue that the person might be developing consolidation or mucus in the lungs. It's just a clue that you can then put pieces together. Doesn't mean the person is going to get pneumonia, but it might lead you to think that. So you're right. If it sounds like an ah sound, I think of Fran Drescher or people from New York, you know, would have a harsher sound. We're going to listen with our stethoscope in the six areas that we were listening to when we were auscultating. So here we go. So I'd like you to say, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to say the letter E. E. Again. E. Again. E. Again. E. Raise your arm up here. And say it again. E. And over here. E. Okay. Very good. Now, uh, when you're practicing today, because we're going to practice after I'm all finished with the system, have your client just so you can hear the difference. Say ah, just so you can see what it which would sound like. I just want to clean my step. Make sure you're cleaning as you go from person to person. Okay, once we've done that, we can do the rest in any order we want. But we want to do auscultation first because of what? Um, I don't remember. The reason I'm even saying these things to you is to understand <coughs> why you're doing something. That separates the professional from the non-professional, okay? So I'll say it again. You probably won't be on any tests, but you're going to be going to clinical, right? Um, the reason you want to listen and auscultate first is that some adventitious breath sounds are discontinuous. That means they disappear when the patient changes position or takes a deep breath. And the one example I gave you is called crackles, or they're also called rails, depending on your source, okay? Bronchi or gurgles are continuous sounds. The person can move around in bed, that sound's not gonna go away. Wheezing is the same thing, it's not gonna go away, okay? All right, next thing I'm gonna do is thoracic expansion. Again, I'm gonna have to ask you that. <laughs> Sorry, Taylor. I don't know. Jackson. Jackson. I called you Taylor before and you didn't correct me. I tell you here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here is where I want to make sure there's symmetrical expansion when my client takes a deep breath. So I'm going to spread my fingers around the lower ribs. I'm sorry. Just take your shirt off if you want. And I'm going to pinch a little skin between my thumbs. So I'm going to see if the thumb skin moves and if I can feel with my fingers. So again, take a deep breath in through your nose and then out through your mouth. Did you see my thumbs move? I pinched a little skin and I should see some movement. <coughs> and I can feel with my hands to make sure it's symmetrical, okay? Next, I'm going to do percussion. And this is where I'm comparing one side to the other. And uh, as you said, the sound I should normally hear is, okay. Again, I'm sorry. It's hard for me to, if you can hold that up, that's good. Notice I'm going to keep all my other fingers up, hitting with two. I'm 
making an S. I'm getting dull. Once you hit dull, you stop. So we go from resonance to dullness. Um, we're comparing one side to the other, making a back and forth S. As soon as I hear dullness, I stop, because the diaphragm is there, right? I also want to do another cueing for consolidation called tactile fremitus. What's that? Um, isn't, isn't that when you measure? No, we're not measuring that. Oh, oh, the right. Uh, it's another cueing for consolidation. We use the number 99 and we're comparing one side to the other. Now normally up here there's nothing to deflect the vibration, right? There's no organs there. So I should normally feel the vibration stronger. As I get down here you have the diaphragm so it's going to be deflected. However, if I start feeling even more vibrations down here, a little light bulb goes up because I had positive egophony, and now I'm feeling vibrations more than I should. So I can start putting the pieces together. A person complained of cough at night, you know, didn't get his flu shot or whatever. So I can put the pieces together. I'm not going to make a diagnosis, but I'm putting the cues together. So I'd like you to say 99. 99, 99, 99. One more time. 99. Okay. So that's tactile fremitus, another cueing system. Now I think what you were talking about measurement has to do with the diaphragmatic excursion. And this is where students get screwed up. So I'm going to try to make it a little easier for you. As you're doing this, you have to realize what you're trying to listen for. Where is the diaphragm, just because you're recording doesn't mean I don't ask you something, where is the diaphragm when you expire, when you take a breath and blow it out? Uh, the diaphragm is lower than the It's higher. You've got to go back to anatomy uh, and physiology. Right. Yeah. Okay, when you expire, the diaphragm relaxes, pushes the waste products out. When you take a breath in, the diaphragm is a muscle, it contracts downward to fill the thoracic cavity with oxygen. Why is that important to know? Because that's what you're percussing for. Now what do you do first with diaphragmatic excursion? In the alphabet, E comes before I. That's the way I remember it. So I know I have to do expiration first, then inspiration, okay? Because in the alphabet, E comes before I. So I'm going to be percussing for expiration, and I'll tell you what to do in a minute, Jackson. But I'm going to be percussing up higher because he's expired. The diaphragm is where? Higher. Higher. Okay. Huh? Higher, higher, right? So that's why I have to start up higher. I'm going to percuss from residence to dullness and make a mark with my pen, okay? So I'd like you to take a de deep breath in, blow it out, and hold it. Go ahead. <laughs> breathe. Make sure you tell your client to breathe. <laughs> make your mark. Does anyone have a pen that will work? I'll, I'll take it out. I'll it down. All right. If you wouldn't mind, you're going to do this on this side. So, see with expiration? No, do expiration. Do both expirations first and then inspiration. Okay. So, what are you going to tell the client to do? Take a deep breath in through his nose and then blow it out and hold it. Okay. Take a deep breath in, blow it out, and hold it. Can I stop? Just breathe normally. <laughs> Come a little closer here because you're doing it right over the bone. Okay. Put your finger down briskly, hard, and hit with two fingers. Listen. Okay. That's what I should hear. Okay. Go ahead.
everyone's going to practice that. You can watch us doing this, and it doesn't make any difference. You've got to practice that. And you've got to know what you're doing. You can't just percuss and say, there it is, diaphragmatic excursion. Diaphragmatic excursion, normally, the distance between expiration and inspiration is anywhere between three and five sonometers. So you have to have your tape, and you measure it in sonometers. Everything in health assessed in sonometers. Okay, I'm going to do inspiration, and then you're going to do it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I don't have to start up as high, because when someone inspires, where is the diaphragm? Down. No, 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 down. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's all right. But think about this, okay, as you're doing it. Think about it. It makes sense if you know what you're doing and you can think it through. So on inspiration, it's going to be lower. So I don't have to start all the way up here because I know the diaphragm is not going to be there. So I can start just above where my mark is for expiration. And I'm going to percuss down from residence to dullness. Right? Okay. Okay, what I want you to do is take a deep breath in this time and hold it. Okay, you can come over here and you're going to do this side. I'll tell them what you want to do. Can you take a deep breath in and hold it, please? Now you leave your hand there till you make your mark. Okay? Remember, all fingers are off the chest except for the middle one. Use two fingers to tap. With my sonometer, I'm going to measure. More. Mine is about six, and yours is a little bit more. I, I think you'd have to look at it again, okay? Because it's too far down. This is too wide of a space. So I'm going to want to see you do it on somebody else, so I can just make sure. All right. Now, when I'm finished, I come back over and I tell my client, I want to thank you for coming today, Jackson. Um, you do have a cough but make sure you're drinking plenty, whatever the issue is. I'm just making this up now. Um, make sure you're drinking plenty of water. If you start running a temperature, you're going to want to see your doctor again. Okay? Do you have any questions of me? Well, thank you for coming. Now, you may have to help them on and off the exam table because these are supposed to be older adults. Don't expect them to jump up here. Okay? Well, let's see how we document thoracic expansion is where you pinch some skin between your thumb, feel with your fingers. Symmetric chest expansion. Respiratory rate and pattern, I have 14 breaths per minute. R for regular, if it was I, it would be I regular, uh, irregular. Auscultate, vesicular breath sounds throughout lung fields, no adventitious sounds. But if you hear something adventitious like wheezing, document it and document where you heard it from, because it's possible. Um, egophony, negative. Tactile fremitus, you can write this different ways. I have equal signs bilaterally. For cus lung fields, I have here hyperresonance over lower lung fields. What does that tell you? don't know. It's not really a clue. Yeah. Maybe it's lower pitch. Hyper resonance is higher pitched. If somebody who has emphysema or COPD, again, the alveoli have more air in it, so the sound is louder. It's transmitted because of the extra air in there. That's not normal. The normal sound we should hear is what? Okay. Don't, don't let me down now. <laughs> we need to know where the diaphragm is on inspiration and expiration, and we need to know when we're documenting breath sounds, that's vesicular, when we're documenting percussion, it's resonance. Memorize that, folks.